going to skip the flattery and the attaboys because I do know this. The sooner that we become less impressed with our life, with our accomplishments, with our career, with whatever that prospect is in front of us, the sooner we become less impressed and more involved with that and these things, the sooner we get a whole lot better at doing it. So, I'm going to talk to you about some things I've learned in my journey. Most from experience, some of them I heard in passing, many of them I'm still practicing, but all of them I do believe are true. Now, they may be truths to me, but don't think that that makes them mine, because you cannot own a truth. So please think of these as signposts, approaches, paradigms that give some science the satisfaction. They're yours to steal, they're yours to share, like into your own lives, to personally apply in your own lives, in your own way, should you choose to. So, here we go. Number one, life's not easy. Life is not easy, it is not. Don't try to make it that way. Life's not fair, it never was, it isn't now and it won't ever be. Do not fall into the trap, the entitlement trap, of feeling like you're a victim. You are not. Get over it and get on with it. And yes, most things are more rewarding when you break a sweat to get them. Fact. Number two, <laughs> I love this. Unbelievable is the stupidest word in the dictionary. Should never come out of our mouths. Think about it. To say, oh wow, what an unbelievable play. Uh, it was an unbelievable book, an unbelievable film, an unbelievable act of courage. Really? It, it may be spectacular, it may be phenomenal, most excellent or outstanding, but unbelievable? Uh -uh. Give others and yourself more credit. It just happened, you witnessed it, you just did it, believe it. What about the other side of unbelievable? You know, that, that side when we humans underperform or act out of our best character. For instance, man flies a suicide jet into the World Trade Center. Millions die from diseases every day that we have cures for. Bob the Builder swears that he's gonna have your house built by Thanksgiving and you can't move in until Christmas the next year. Our best friends lie to us and we lie to ourselves all the time. Unbelievable? I don't think so. Again, it just happens and it happens every day. Nothing that we homo sapien earthlings do is unbelievable. And if there's one thing you can depend on people being, it's people. So we shouldn't be surprised. We, us, are the trickiest mammals walking the planet. I'm not worried about the monkeys. I'm worried about you and me. <laughs> so acknowledge the acts of greatness as real and do not be naive about mankind's capacity for evil nor be in denial of our own shortcomings. Happiness is an emotional response to an outcome. If I win, I will be happy. If I don't, I won't. It's an if-then, cause and effect, quid pro quo, standard that we cannot sustain because we immediately raise it every time we attain it. You see, happiness, happiness demands a certain outcome. It is result-reliant. And I say, if happiness is what you're after, then you're going to be let down frequently, and you're going to be unhappy much of your time. Joy, though. Joy is a different thing. It's something else. Joy is not a choice. It's not a response to some result. It's a constant. Joy is the feeling that we have from doing what we are fashioned to do, no matter the outcome. Now, personally, as an actor, I started enjoying my work and literally being more happy when I stopped trying to make the daily labor a means to a certain end. For example, uh, I need this film to be a box office success. You know, I need my performance to be acknowledged. I, I need the respect of my peers. All of those are reasonable aspirations, but the truth is, as soon as the work the daily making of the movie, the doing of the deed, became the reward in itself for me. I got more box office, more accolades and respect than I ever had before. See, joy is always in process. It's under construction. It is in constant approach, alive and well in the doing of what we're fashioned to do and enjoying it. 
Number four, define success for yourself. Define success for yourself. Now check this out. I'm in uh, south of New Orleans uh, a few years ago and I went to a voodoo shop. Uh, and they had this, this, this wooden partition against the wall with these columns. And, and in these columns were all these vials of these magic potions, right? And the headings above each potion defining what they would give you were things like fertility, health, uh, family, legal health, energy, forgiveness, money. Guess which column was empty? Money. Let's admit it. Money is king today. It's what make the world, makes the world go round. It is success. The more we have, the more successful we are, right? Now, I would argue that our cultural values have even been financialized. Financialized. Uh, Humility is not in vogue anymore. It's too passive to get rich quick on the internet, rich is 15 minutes of fame world that we live in, and we see it every day. But we all want to succeed, right? So the question that we got to ask ourselves is what success is to us, what success is to you? Is it more money? That's fine, I got nothing against money. No? Maybe it's a healthy family. Maybe it's a happy marriage. Maybe it's to help others, to be famous, to be spiritually sound leave the world a little bit better place than you found it. Continue to ask yourself that question. Now your answer may change over time and that's fine, but do yourself this favor. Whatever your answer is, don't choose anything that will jeopardize your soul. Prioritize who you are, who you want to be, and don't spend time with anything that antagonizes your character. Don't drink the Kool-Aid, man. It tastes sweet, but you will get cavities tomorrow, all right? Life is not a popularity contest. Be brave, take the hill, but first answer that question, what's my hill? So, me, how do I, fi- how do I define success for me, myself? Well, for me, it's a measurement of, uh, of five things. We got fatherhood, we got being a good husband, we got my health, mind, body, and spirit, we got career, and we got friendships. These are what's important to me in my life right now. So I try to measure these five things each day. I check in with them. I I like to see whether or not I'm in the uh, the, the debit section or the credit section with each one. Am I in the the red or am I in the black? You follow? For instance, sometimes say my career is rolling. All right, it's way up here in the black, but I see how my relationship with my wife maybe could use a little bit more of my attention. I got to pick up the slack on being a better husband. Get that one out of the red. Or say my spiritual health could use some maintenance. It's down here, but hey man, my friendships and my social life, they're in high gear, right? I gotta recalibrate, checks and balances. I gotta go to church, remember to say thank you more often, something. But I gotta take the tally because I wanna keep all five in healthy shape. And I know that if I don't take care of them, if I don't keep up maintenance on them, One of them is gonna get weak, man. It's gonna dip too deep into the debit section. It's gonna go bankrupt. It's gonna get sick, die even. So first, we have to define success for ourselves. And then we have to put in the work to maintain it. Take that daily tally, tend our garden, keep the things that are important to us in good shape. I mean, let's admit it. We've all got two wolves in us, a good one, and a bad one, and they both want to eat. Best I can tell, we just got to feed that good one a little more than the other one. Here we go, number five. Process of elimination (laughs) is the first step to our identity, AKA where you are not is as important as where you are. All right, 1992, I got my first job as an actor. Three lines, three days work, and a film called Dazed and Confused. So this director of that film, Richard Linkletter, he kept inviting me back to set each night, putting me in more scenes, which led to more lines, all of which I happily said yes to. I mean, I'm having a blast. People are telling me I'm good at what I'm doing, and they're writing me a check for $325 a day. I mean. Hell yeah, give me more scenes. I love what I'm doing. Well, 
by the end of the shoot, by the end of the film, those three lines had turned into over three weeks' work, and it was mine. It was Wooderson's 1970 Chevelle that we went to go get Aerosmith tickets in, man. Yeah, it was badass. <laughs> well, a few years ago, I'm watching this film again, and I noticed two scenes that I really shouldn't have been in. And one of these scenes, my character Wooderson, I, I, I exit screen left to head somewhere, and then I re-enter the screen and to double check if any of the other characters wanted to go with me. Now, in re-watching the film, and you'll agree if you know Wooderson, <laughs> Wooderson's not a guy who would ever say, later, and then come back to see if you were sure you didn't want to go. <laughs> now, when Wooderson leaves, Wooderson is gone. He does not stutter, step, flinch, rewind, ask twice, or solicit. You know what I'm talking about. Wooderson has better things to do, like liking those high school girls, man, because I get older and they stay the same age. The point is, I should not have been in that scene. I shouldn't have come back. I should have exited screen left and never come back. But back then, making my first film, getting invited back to the set, cashing that check and having a ball, I wanted more screen time. I wanted to be in the scene longer and more and come back into the scene, right? But I shouldn't have been there. Wooderson shouldn't have been there. It is just as important where we are not as it is where we are. Look, the first step that leads to our identity in life is usually not, I know who I am, I know who I am. That's not the first step. The first step's usually, I know who I am not. Process of elimination. Defining ourselves by what we are not is the first step that leads us to really knowing who we are. You know that group of friends that you hang out with that they really might not bring out the best in you? You know, they, they gossip too much or they're kind of shady. They really aren't going to be there for you in a pinch. Or how about that bar that we keep going to that we always seem to have the worst hangover from? Or that computer screen, right? That computer screen that keeps giving us an excuse not to get out of the house and engage with the world and get some real human interaction. Or how about that food that we keep eating? That stuff that tastes so good going down and makes us feel like crap the next week when we feel lethargic and we keep putting on weight? Well, those people, those places, those things, stop giving them your time and energy. Just don't go there. I mean, put them down. And when you do this, when you do put them down, when you quit going there, and you quit giving them your time, you inadvertently find yourself spending more time and in more places that are healthy for you, that bring you more joy. Why? Because you just eliminated the who's, the where's, the what's, and the when's that were keeping you from your identity. Look, trust me, too many options, <laughs> I promise you, too many options will make a tyrant of us all. All right, so get rid of the excess, the wasted time. Decrease your options. And if you do this, you will have accidentally, almost innocently, put in front of you what is important to you by process of elimination. Knowing who we are is hard. It's hard. So give yourself a break. Eliminate who you are not first, and you're going to find yourself where you need to be. Number six, don't leave crumbs <laughs> and the beauty of delayed gratification. So what are crumbs? Well, the crumbs I'm talking about are the choices that we make that make us have to look over our shoulder in the future. You didn't pay that guy back the money that you owed him and tonight you just saw him three rows behind you. Shit. You slept around on your spouse and you just found out that tomorrow she and the lady you're having an affair with are going to be at the same PTA meeting. Shit again. You drank too much last night. You're too hungover to drive your son to his 8 a.m. Saturday morning baseball practice. These are the crumbs. They come in the form of regret, guilt, and remorse. You leave crumbs today, they will cause you more stress tomorrow and they disallow you from creating a customized future in which you do not have to look over your shoulder. So let's flip the script. 
Instead of creating outcomes that take from us, let's create more outcomes that pay us back, fill us up, keep your fire lit, turn you on for the most amount of time in your future. These are the choices I'm talking about. And this is the beauty of delayed gratification. All right, tee yourself up, do yourself a favor, make the choices, the purchases today that pay you back tomorrow. Residuals. In my business, we call it mailbox money. If I do my job well today, and that movie keeps rerunning on TV, five years from now, I'm getting checks in the mailbox. It's a heck of a deal. So whether it's prepping the coffee maker the night before, so all you gotta do is press the button in the morning, or getting ready for the job interview early so you don't have to cram the night before, or choosing not to hook up with that married woman because you know you're gonna feel horrible about it tomorrow, and her husband carries a gun, or paying your debts on time so that when you do see that guy three rows back tonight, you don't have to hunker down in your seat hoping that he don't see you. Get some ROI. You know what that is? Return on investment. Your investment. You. Customize your future. Don't leave crumbs. Number seven. Dissect your successes and the reciprocity of gratitude. We so often focus on failure, don't we? We study failure. We obsess with failure. We dissect failure and our failures. We dissect them so much we end up intoxicated with them to the point of disillusion. I mean, when do we write in our diary? Usually when we're depressed. What do we gossip about? Other people's flaws and limitations. And we can dissect ourselves into self-loathing if we're not careful. I find that most of the times our obsession with what is wrong just ends up breeding more wrong, more failure. Now, the easiest way to dissect success is through gratitude. Giving thanks for that which we do have, for what is working. Appreciating the simple things we sometimes take for granted. We give thanks for these things and that gratitude reciprocates, creating more to be thankful for. It's really simple and it works. Now I'm not saying be in denial of your failures. No, we can learn from them too, but only if we look at them constructively as a means to reveal what we are good at, what we can get better at, what we do succeed at. Now personally, I've read a whole lot of my bad reviews. Right? I've had quite a few. Written by the more talented critics, they are the ones who give constructive bad news. They reveal to me what did translate in my work, what came across, what was seen, or what wasn't. Now, I don't obsess on the unfavorable aspect of their review, but I do seek what I can learn from it. Because their displeasure actually uncovers and makes more